Um, so, good evening. Jason, am I doing okay? Good sound? Okay, cool. Um, my name is Mike, as Nate said. Um, how many people here know what a background job is? How many people have apps that use a background job system? Okay. So, pretty, I'm, I'm guessing you're pretty familiar with uh, the concept. So, we'll go through it pretty quick. Um, quickly about me. I've been doing software for about half my life. Uh, Ruby since Rails came out in 2005 and uh, recently took up Go, I guess recently five years, being five years. And I've been building background job systems for a decade now. Um, and so Factory is my third, no, it's my fourth one, my fourth system. So um, <clears throat> Ruby on Rails was a big um, impetus for a career change for me Previously, I was doing Enterprise Java, and it got me into the open source community. Uh, Ruby is primarily an open source community, and so I started maintaining gems. And almost every Rails app has some sort of background job system uh, to, to do a lot of its work and the, the heavy lifting therein. And so I was building custom background job systems for various startups that I was working at in Ruby. And so Sidekick was my attempt to build something better than uh, the, the best practices at the time, which was delayed job and rescue. When I started Sidekick, though, I'd been doing a, a number of open source projects before that, and the one thing that I did not want to do is create a super popular project that had um, no uh, way of sustaining it long term, because I knew if Sidekick took off that it would be around for a decade, and people would be asking me for support every single day. And that's been... Um, the smartest decision I've ever made because I get customer support emails rolling in every single day. And so I created commercial versions of Sidekick to, uh, to sell to customers and that has become successful and I formed a company, Contributed Systems, five years ago to, to make that legit. And so that is my career these days, is, is supporting my customers all around the world. <clears throat> So today, I want to tell you a story about business applications, I suppose. Um, talk a little bit about background job theory. Talk a little bit about factory directly. Um, if anybody has a Mac, uh, I want, I'm going to show a demo. And I'm going to show you how to run the demo on your own machine if you're interested in, in following along and, and trying and kicking the tires, so to speak. Uh, and then I'm going to finish the talk with some pro tips about background jobs in general. So we've all shopped on Amazon. Um, you search for whatever you're looking for, you look at a couple products, you throw it in your cart, and then you hit place order. The question though is how many of us have actually thought about what happens when you hit place order? Uh, I used to work at an e-commerce company and it's amazingly complex uh, what all goes, goes on behind the scenes there. So let's think about that for a second. When you hit place order, the first thing the system does is it's gonna take that input into the server and it's going to validate it. Uh, but the two most important things it needs to do is reserve inventory and charge that credit card. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that it needs to do uh, also, like send the user an email. Uh, it needs to sync various third-party systems. Maybe you've got some APIs that you need to call. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen here. And the reality is, though, that all of that is really slow, fragile, you may be calling half a dozen or a dozen third-party services, and each one individually may guarantee three or four nines, but together, you may only see, you're, you may see outages every day, every other day, because you're using so many third-party services. So the key question is, can I do this later? Can I somehow store the fact that I need to do these various tasks? So for any business application, by the, by the number of raised hands I saw, you all probably know all this already, but you do as little as possible to render your page, and then you create jobs for everything else. You somehow persist the fact that I've got to run these, these various different tasks. So theoretically, what we're talking about is something like this. I mean, to me, that looks like a function call, right? So your, your application is gonna provide these various functions, and it takes a couple bits of state and it knows enough to, to do that business operation. 
And so that, that turns into background jobs. What, what a job is at, at, you know, at the lowest, sort of the crux of what it is, is the name and a set of arguments for, for your business operations. Um, and, and like I said, those kind of map directly in your application to functions that you can call on any, any number of machines. You can, you can scale this out to any number of machines as long as you can send it to your application running on this machine. Just say run this, run this function. So <clears throat> what should a, a good background job system provide you? Well, there are some basics. You need some scheduling. You, you obviously want to say, uh, do this thing right now. So the customer places an order, send this email right now. <clears throat> you also want to be able to do something at some time period in the future. Um, so let's say you get a new user. You want to send them in a welcome email 24 hours from now. That's a little nudge for them to come back to your site and use the site some more, right? So you say, run this job in 24 hours, and that job is send the user a, a welcome email. And uh, the, the third one is kind of a variant of the second one or, or, or vice versa. Um, all you're doing is basically scheduling in, in, in the same sort of way. Um, so scheduling is one thing that the job system should provide. Um, I, I would argue that the biggest one is error handling. The reason why you're creating all these jobs to handle all these tasks um, a lot of the times is for performance, but the other, th the other reason is for reliability. Your background job system is usually going to be local to your system, whereas your, these third-party systems are all going across the, the wild west that is the internet. And so at any, at any given time, people could be deploying their code or, or have some downtime. And so error handling is really necessary for almost every sort of business operation you're gonna do. Uh, and the key thing, um, that Sidekick introduced to background job systems is this concept of a retry system that is always on by default. And that if you just write a background job in Sidekick, it will automatically retry it for you. And it, it also has this notion of an exponential back off, which is key. Obviously, you don't want to retry something every minute for the rest of your life. Um, so indeed, you, you try it a minute from now, two minutes from now, an hour from now, whatever. But the point is, is that uh, an initial breakage, you want, you want to retry pretty quickly so that if it was just a blip or something, that the job is still finished quickly. But the, the error could all have also been a bug in your code. And in that case, you want the job to just kind of sit there in the queue until you can deploy a fix. And then once you deploy a fix, then, then that job will automatically retry and run successfully. So um, third thing that you're going to want is some sort of monitoring. Um, I don't know how many people have used background job systems. Uh, other ones like Rabbit, based on RabbitMQ or SQS, those are, those are also quite popular. But a lot of times those systems can be a black box because they don't have uh, that, that monitoring capability. They don't have the capability to, to push uh, stats D metrics and that sort of thing. So, so monitoring is, is something that your, any job system is, is, should think about um, and have some sort of solution for. Lastly, and, and arguably the most, perform, the most important, uh, it should be performant. This, this system needs to, needs to scale with your business. Uh, you know, everything works if, if you only need to do one thing a second, but it can it do 100 things a second? Can it do 1,000 things per second? There's a limit to that. We're, when we're talking about business transactions, you're, you're at Facebook scale, maybe you're gonna be doing a billion business transactions a day, but most organizations aren't. So background jobs are, have this nice point of about 1,000, 10,000 per second where they work, where they scale to. Beyond that, you're talking about using something like Kafka or a system that is better designed to handle hundreds of thousands of things per second or millions of things per second. And that's a whole different architecture and a whole different design of a system. So there is a sweet spot for background jobs that, uh, for business apps that, that you need to be aware of and think about how far do I need to scale when I'm talking performance.
So um, let's, I won't bore you anymore with theory. Let's talk about what this thing looks like in practice. Um, if any of you have a computer science background, you may have heard of queuing theory. But a background job system is essentially a queue. So you've got a pr producer, you've got a queue, which is your pers persistent store, and then you've got a consumer. And typically you'll have lots of producers and lots of, of consumers. So in any sort of business or any sort of busy system, you're gonna have lots of these things all, all talking amongst each other. But the, um, the job of the client is to create new jobs. That's all it does. It doesn't know how to, it doesn't know how to implement those jobs. It just knows the name of the job and the state that it, that job may require. Uh, the queue can be anything. Uh, like I said, RabbitMQ and SQS are popular. A Redis is also quite popular as a backing store for queues. Um, and there's also some uh, uh, more proprietary, open, proprietary but still open source systems that sort of implement their own persistent store. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the consumer, uh, which is usually uh, can, knows how to boot your application and can pull those jobs off of the queue and can execute um, those jobs within that, that worker process. So job systems are quite popular by the hands. I could tell that you know almost every business application to some extent needs a job system. There's lots of different ones. Um, and, and these ones are, are popular, but one thing about these is that they're all language specific. Uh, and that's typically because they're implemented as part of this worker, and they, they, they're, they're implemented as a library that implements the worker and the client. So side, the sidekick gem implements a worker and it implements the client. Uh, and the, the store is just Redis. So sidekick is running here, it talks to Redis directly. Uh, and the sidekick client API knows how to push to Redis directly. So since everything is implemented in the two processes below, they're language specific. And so there's, there's not much you can do about that. In the case of Sidekick, it can only execute Ruby code. In the case of Celery, it can only execute Python code. And likewise for all these, these different systems. There is a breed of job systems though that can, that are language independent. And that's because the way that they're architected is that they're implemented as that queue up above. And they provide a protocol for a binding of any language to push and fetch and act fail uh, jobs. And so that, that binding is what integrates it, that, that uh, language independent system with whatever language you wanna use. So uh, language independent systems would be things like Beanstalk, uh, Gearman is another one. Neither one is terribly popular these days. Uh, the main ones are RabbitMQ and SQS, which they're not real job systems, they're message queues, which have slightly different semantics. Uh, and they also oftentimes expose a lot more complexity than is really warranted. So, uh, and for something like SQS, it's, it's almost a true black box. It's really hard to know sort of what's in your SQS and, and and to be able to, that monitoring part, SQS doesn't really handle uh, terribly well. You, you might argue with me on that, but, but I, I would argue it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's tough to monitor. So um, factory is my language independent job system. Um, and like I said, going back to this diagram, um, there is, a, client and a worker library for each particular language that wants to use factory. And factory itself is a daemon that uh, you, you run 24 seven. And it runs Redis internally as its backing store. So factory doesn't actually implement persistence onto disk directly, it outsources that to Redis. But you don't need to run Redis yourself. Factory actually embeds it uh, and, and knows how to start it up and manage it itself. So you don't need to uh, think about Redis at all. Uh, and like, like the diagram shows, you can have multiple clients pushing jobs to factory uh, in parallel. You can have multiple factory workers fetching uh, and performing jobs all in parallel. Uh, if you're 
familiar with Sidekick and the way it's implemented, you'll, you'll recognize this will look very familiar. But this is what an actual factory job looks like. Um, one of the most important things for every job is that each job has its own unique ID. And that gives you and your application the ability to track that job. Uh, so you can store in your database, I've created a job with this ID, and, uh, and then be able to track it as that job is, is, uh, is started and performed. But uh, the, obviously, we've got a named queue that that job is going to go on to. We've got the type of the job, set of arguments or, or state for that job. And then some housekeeping internally. Uh, there's time timestamps that are relevant. Uh, that retry attribute is what powers factory's default retry system. So you can change that number. If you want to change the number of retries, you can actually turn off uh, retries if you want. And then finally, there's a custom hash, which allows you to attach any sort of custom data to the job that you want that middleware can, can work on and, and fetch that those attributes and, and power some sort of functionality. In this case, this job is using the um, unique feature so that that job can only be pushed every 65 seconds. If you try to push another copy of an exact copy of that job, it will, um, it will raise an error and, uh, and not allow it. So that's what that, uh, that custom data is there for. I should also say, if there's any questions about what I'm talking about, if I'm losing anybody, please stop me and ask questions. You're, you're, you're more than welcome to. So, um, so we talked a little bit about what the architecture looks like. We talked about uh, the actual data that is a job uh, when persisted. Um, the protocol, uh, you might have already picked up on based on the diagram, but it's, it's just a very limited set of verbs. Um, you, you push a blob of JSON, uh, and that blob of JSON must have a set of attributes which, which fulfill the factory protocol, like a JID. It must have a unique JID. It must have a Q attribute. Well, going back to what we saw, basically you need to have um, four or five of those attributes. Otherwise, factory will, will blow up on you and, and say, no, nah, that's, that's not going to work, boy. Um, so <laughs> the push is what the client does, obviously. Uh, fetch is what your workers do. So the fetch, the fetch takes uh, uh, in queue, queue names. And so a worker can say, give me a job from any of these queues. And that's a strict priority. So factory will look in Q1 first, then it'll look in Q2, then Q3. And whichever queue has a job in it, it'll pop that, that job off the queue and return it as uh, the result of that fetch. Once a worker gets a job, uh, it parses it and then dispatches that job to your application code, however, however that worker may work. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the key thing the worker needs to do is once it's performed that, that job, it either needs to acknowledge that that job was done successfully or it needs to call fail to say that this job uh, had some sort of error so that factory can um, save that, persist that, uh, for your monitoring in, in, within the web UI. All the, the protocol responses uh, use Redis's protocol. So that RESP is, is Redis's line-oriented protocol. So if you're familiar with Redis commands and how they work, uh, Factory is going to look pretty familiar. I, I borrowed heavily from Redis since I, I really respect that project in terms of how pragmatic uh, uh, he is and how simple he keeps uh, the way he implements things. So since there is a generic protocol that is documented by factory, uh, lots of people have implemented the factory protocol within whatever language that they, they enjoy programming in. Um, I, being a Ruby and Go uh, developer, I provide Ruby and Go worker libraries for anybody that wants to use factory with those two languages. But there is a whole set of, of open source libraries that other people maintain. Um, we're the demo that I'm going to show you tonight is based on JavaScript. So we're going to be installing um, some the factory worker library for JavaScript and showing you just real, some really basic JavaScript creating and executing uh, background jobs. Uh, but there's almost every 
popular business application language has a worker library at this point. There's, I think, 10 or a dozen of them in total. So um, this is the point in the talk where I show you a bit of a demo. And if anybody has a Mac and wants to follow along, you're, you're welcome to, uh, to join me. Sure. Um, do you have a specific aspect that you want me to? Yeah. So, so Factory has a UI, which I'm going to show you um, once. The, how do I, where's my? <laughs> No, it's okay. It's, it's definitely something we can talk about. Um, Factory has a UI, which um, will give you not only sort of a real-time dashboard as jobs are processed, but it'll also show you the set of queues that you have, the jobs that are in those queues. You can page through you know, large queues. Uh, it also has um, tabs for your scheduled jobs so that you can see what's going to be running in the near future. Uh, it has um, a tab for all your, your retries, which are what I call jobs that are pending retry. So you can, you can sort of, and, and on each of these jobs that have failed, you can see the backtrace that corresponds to that failure. And so from the UI, you could even drill in and figure out, oh, that's a bug in my code right on that line. Fix the bug, deploy it, and, and immediately just say retry the job. So it's, it's, It, it uh, factory itself has a opens a port and exposes a web a web UI. So when you run factory, uh, there's two ports that it opens. That what I call the command port. That's what all the workers and clients talk to using the protocol, and then the web port, and that's what you can use a browser to go to, and that's what uh, you see with the UI. So I'm going to try and find my mouse. Is it over there? There it is. Where is it in relation to this? Yes, I'll gather when. Um, that is a good question. It, the answer is not really right now. Um, Factory does not have yet as much functionality as Sidekick has, especially enterprise, I should say. Um, the open source version of Sidekick is totally battle tested and has very, I get very few bug reports about it anymore. Uh, it should just work, quote unquote. Um, Factory is newer, I just released 1.0, so it has yet to be battle scarred. That said, there, are, there have been people running it in production for you know, a year now, so I know it's stable, um, but it doesn't necessarily handle every edge case that Sidekick does. And there's a number of features that Factory just simply doesn't have yet that Sidekick does have. I should say uh, Sidekick Pro and Sidekick Enterprise has. Um, almost all this the open source Sidekick functionality has been ported to Factory at this point. Yep. So I'm going to, can I turn this off and just mirror it? Where, where is it? Where is the mirroring? All right. Um, so I'm going to, here, I'll, I will, first of all, I'll put that up a little bit longer so people can go to the URL. But I'm just going to go to the URL like y'all, and because I've got a README which has directions on exactly what to do. So if you go to that URL, you can literally just cut and paste exactly what I'm doing. All right. So if I go here. So I have a really dumb JavaScript app, which I wrote. And I'm going to, well, I'm going to pass this one because I've already installed Factory. Um, I'd be a pretty bad maintainer if I didn't have Factory installed. But um, you all just need to run those two commands. Um, and it may take a couple minutes to install Factory because it's got to install a bunch of stuff. But once you do that, 
We can do this. Uh, let's see. Back in. So I'm going to open up three tabs because remember we have the client factory itself and then the worker that we need to run. So first thing, I'm going to I'll, I'll also open up the web UI so that we can check it out. <coughs> So that is factory running right now that we just started. I'm gonna increase the size of it so you all can see it a little better. Um, but if I go back to here, we're going to install our NPM dependencies. And then start a client. And that client is just going to start pushing a job every second. So there's our jobs. And then I'm going to start a worker. And that's the worker um, executing all the jobs that it queued up before it started. And you saw it went, went really fast. Now if we go back to our UI, we can see that we did a bunch of jobs, and now we've reached the steady state where we're just doing a job every second at this point. Um, so this is so this is the basic web UI for Factory. Um, it does store some longer history, so that you can sort of see as the weeks and months pass how many jobs have I been executing, and, and it shows both uh, how many failed and how many were successfully processed. Um, I, I mentioned monitoring in general, so that's one aspect of monitoring. The, from a developer's perspective, the main thing that you might look at is your retries, because that's jobs that have errored out. And so let's go into here and take a look at this page. Oops. So these are three jobs that have failed. We can see the error here. Um, apparently, the worker package does not know what some job is. So that it just the worker just raised that error and failed it to factory, and so that's that's all that factory knows. If I jump into the job specifically, I can see more data about it. Um, you can see it's already retried four times. Probably not ever gonna work. <laughs> um, but you can also see more details about the error down here. So you get the actual backtrace, uh, and you can see it's coming from the factory example. My, my, my JavaScript app that I recently restarted. Down here, I, can, I have options for either deleting it or retrying it immediately if I, if I want to do that. Since we know that this is never gonna work, I could just hit delete if I wanted to. You can also do the same thing by just selecting all and hitting delete. So that, that is something that is nice from a developer perspective. When you have a bug in your code, you can go through and find the jobs that are affected by that bug and just immediately, immediately rerun them. Any questions so far? All right. So um, we can see that we've just been trucking away. I'll show you um, what the code looks like for that client and that worker real quick. So the client is as simple as, you know, connect to factory. Well, we're going to require the, the worker package. We're going to connect to factory. And then we're just going to add a job. And the, the first argument is the, is the type of that job. And then the rest of the arguments are whatever arguments you want to pass to that job. And uh, once we, and, and really we're just creating a, a timer here to loop every, every thousand milliseconds, every second. To, uh, to create a job. And it's, and it's really as simple as that. It's, it's just a single line to create a job. Uh, the worker is even simpler. We require our worker package. We register the job uh, type that we know how to execute and provide the implementation for that, that job type. And then starting a worker is just as simple as calling that method because it just never returns. 
Um, it'll it'll automatically uh, respond to signals and shut down gracefully as as necessary. So when I said this is a stupid simple app, I, I really meant it. It's um, what twenty lines of code total. Uh, any questions? So periodic jobs is 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 what that's what I call that, um, and factory does not implement that. That is a commercial feature which I sell. So got to get them somehow, right? Um, so I do offer a commercial version of factory that has um, that unique jobs feature, which deduplicates jobs. Uh, it also provides cron jobs. Uh, it provides a Redis replication. So if you want to create a real-time replica of your background job system, because remember, it's, it's using Redis behind the scenes to persist it. Um, uh, Factory Pro will expose Redis so that you can actually attach a replica to it and, and get real-time replication. Um, but there's uh, a number of features that I'm planning on adding to the various commercial uh, versions. Um, but the way I, I see it is, is factory is, is it's enough to, uh, it's enough for a lot of business applications. A lot of business apps don't need more than this. Um, and it's, and when people start to build their entire business app on top of factory, that's when the wanting to get all those other features really becomes uh, more of a draw. And, and that's when the budget is, you know, I find freed up. To, to purchase those, but uh, but yeah, that's that's my my business model. Yes. Um. So, like, more of an API, like a programmatic API, or do you mean from the the web UI? So the one, I do have an API um, to do sort of programmatic maintenance, but it only works on the retries and scheduled. I find that uh, if people have jobs, like let's say you create a job um, and you've got a thousand copies of that job um, that you created a week ago, but you removed that functionality from your app. Now you need to get rid of all those jobs, right? Um, the, the API that I have allows you to programmatically iterate through, um, it, actually you don't iterate through it, you tell factory, um, here's a match, uh, a matching sort of, uh, what am I looking, here's a structure that represents um, a way of matching jobs within factory and please perform this operation on them. So like delete them all. And so there, there is what, what is called the mutate API, um, which implements that. And if you go into the wiki, uh, where is, do I have a link to factories wiki? I don't. Wonderful. So if we go to contrib, code source, container, so in the wiki here, there is a bunch of documentation about various aspects. Um, one of them though is this, what's called a mutate API. And you can see the pitch here, but um, it's, it's really designed for data migrations and, and sort of one time by hand mutations. Uh, I, I find that it's not often that you wanna just look at your queues. The queue, a queue kind of represents your happy path, your, your steady state of your business application. Under normal circumstances, jobs should go into a queue and be pulled out of the queue really fast, within milliseconds or seconds. It's, it's only when they fail and they start going into the scheduled set or the retry set that um, things get backed up and you need to take action manually. And so that's what this is, is really designed for. All right, what else? So I, I, I showed, um, or rather I, I clicked on the cues here. You can, you can 
dive into the jobs that are in the queues. But like I said, the queue, the, the worker is clearing the queue so fast that the web UI is just not going to show anything. Um, that that the fetching a, a, a job from for the worker is a blocking call. So the microsecond you put a job on Redis, the worker gets it. And so it's it's in and out within you know less than a microsecond less than a millisecond. Um, you can also in the in the busy tab you'll see a list of processes. These are these are going to be your worker processes that are uh, so you can see how many depending on the concurrency of your process you can see how many are busy. Maybe you're maybe you can execute up to twenty jobs per process. Who knows? Um, and it also shows you the jobs that are if you have some long running jobs you'll see them uh, listed in that table. So you can kind of get an idea of what what jobs are is your system uh, executing right now. All right, what else? So um, Factory does have um, a middleware API, but it's Go, so you can't sort of dynamically plug stuff into it. If you wanted to build your own middleware, you'd have to, you'd have to sort of build your own um, proprietary uh, copy of, of Factory, which you can totally do, and that's, that's completely legit with the license. Um, but I, I provide um, metrics, again, in Factory Pro. There is, there is real-time metrics that I will ship off to StatsD, so that, that is, again, uh, sort of StatsD and that sort of real-time monitoring is, to me, if your business requires that, then you should just pay for the Pro version. Right, that's kind of my, yeah. So, um, so that is that is implemented in I document. You can see it, all the different metrics that are th these metrics. You know, correspond to the web UI. A lot of the web UI metrics also, um, but things like real time Redis uh, metrics, so that you can sort of monitor the the health of Redis and how much memory Factory is using. Um, that sort of thing uh, is is all thrown into StatsD for you to. Uh, to graph on whatever dashboard you may have. I mean, alerting, how do you alert, right? It's yeah. with a web page. You can't, I mean, to me, alerting is, right. And then I've got to implement all the different ways of alerting people. Right. To me, that's, that's something that kind of once I ship off a metric, to an external system, to me, my job's done. And whatever you're using for monitoring and metrics, you're probably also using to alert off of. And so by me throwing my metrics in there, then you can just roll out some new alert on it, right? Datadog, I know, will do alerting based on metrics that you, so you can push these metrics to Datadog. <clears throat> yep, same, same difference. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I didn't want to get, I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole of trying to sort of reinvent that wheel. So this is kind of where I, I draw the line. I, I, I allow you to ship off metrics to the system of your choice as long as it's stats D. But um, a couple of people have asked for Prometheus, so I, I may add Prometheus based on demand. Um, but that's, that's kind of where, the, that's kind of the metrics that are, are available. The factory um, has a Ruby gem, uh, which is a, it's, I think it's um, creatively called Factory Worker Ruby. <laughs> I didn't bother coming up with a, a fancy name for it. But um, uh, it provides uh, an active job adapter. So factory actually can be used with active job. So uh, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to guarantee that you could just. Um, Port your sidekick jobs to active job and then immediately flip over to factory. Um, there's there's sort of orthogonal concerns and active job at the heart of it. It's kind of kind of basic. 
um, in, in the, the features that it, it exposes. So uh, a lot of times people have, for instance, data migration job uh, rake tasks that use the Sidekick API, right? That's not gonna work with Factory. So a lot of those concerns uh, are something that, that need to be uh, explored uh, and, and seen if uh, what alternative uh, might be available if you did want to port to it. Factory really shines when you have a business app that wants to use multiple languages, though. If you just have a Rails app, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use Factory. I'd use Sidekick. Um, right, but yeah, if you say you did have multiple languages. Yeah, if you have an Elixir app, Sidekick. But if you see... The nice, the nice thing about Factory is that um, once you learn it in one language, it's the same in every other language. So if you're if you're building an Elixir app this year, and you're going to be building a Python app next year, you can use the same infrastructure for both of them, right? You don't have to learn a, whole, you don't have to use some Elixir thing for jobs in your that app, and then Celery and some other app, and have them be two completely separate things. You can essentially just reuse that that same infrastructure. All right, um, so let's go back to the presentation. That's not what I wanted. So um, I don't know if anybody tried the demo, but hopefully you all followed along and got something out of that. Uh, there's the web UI as I call out here. Uh, so I wanted to finish with some pro tips uh, about background jobs in general. Uh, there's three things that I tell everybody. Um, first thing about background jobs is keep it small. I, I see pretty regularly, I see Sidekick customers, maybe they're trying to build like a web, web scraper or web crawler in Sidekick, and they'll download the entire HTML page and pass that as the job argument. And so, you know, it, that might be a megabyte of HTML. That's not really... <laughs> Not really a great idea. Um, take that artifact and, and persist it somewhere, whether it's in your database, whether it's in S3 or a, a flat file or whatever. Um, pass simple identifiers and file paths and stuff like that in your jobs. And that way uh, your jobs are much faster to, um, to move around the system. All right. Uh, and, and the other thing to be aware is, is whether it's Sidekick or Factory, they both use JSON as their native tongue. So you have to stick with JSON uh, types, native types. And so that's the, the basic six there. Um, I do pretty regularly see Rubyists trying to pass more complex Ruby objects into a background job. And then they, they wonder why some crazy string uh, is what they got in their, in their job. And that's because you, you kind of, you need, to, you need to serialize whatever complex object you want yourself into some simpler state form. Uh, the other thing is that your job may be executed many times. That, that retry uh, formula that both Sidekick and Factory use, it can execute your job, you know, four or five times in the course of 10 minutes. And so you need to be, uh, aware that here's a here's a simple background job for instance this is like an example of a refund right. if you, someone says I'd like my credit card refunded I decided I'm going to return it so you're going to find that that charge in the database and you're going to call some void transaction on it and that may call out to Braintree to uh, to to void it and then you're going to send an email to the customer saying hey I just refunded your your transaction. Well, the issue is what happens when that email fails. If that email server is down, that background job is going to retry over and over and over. And now you're going to void that transaction over and over and over. And so uh, that's, a, that's a, an example where you need to think about that business transaction and how do you make it uh, item potent. You can use database transactions if you're just doing work in the database. Uh, but if you're using a third-party API, you need, uh, Stripe, for instance, has uh, in their API support for um, idempotent requests. And so you, pay, you pass a, a unique key to Stripe, and 
Stripe will not will will only process the the transaction associated with that key once in 24 hours. So if you if you retry that that void over and over and over, Stripe will just say, okay, it worked. It, and no matter how many times you try it in that 24 hours, because the first time it succeeded, and the other times they know it's a no-op. So that is uh, uh, something to be aware of. Where people run into this all and see this happen, um, bad things happen all the time, is when they're sending emails. So they'll, they'll send an email every five minutes to a customer until the job is fixed. And you can get some irate customers pretty quickly if you, if you do that a lot. Yeah, so execution is tough. Um, when you are executing a job, uh, it's gonna be running in some thread, and I don't know of any way in computer science to kill a thread and ensure that your data is safe. It, you cannot make those guarantees, and, and that's because when you kill a thread, it could stop at any point in the execution. Um, it may stop it at some point when you're when you're handling um, an insure block to to commit a transaction. And so there's so killing a thread, um, having a timeout, and say killing a thread after a minute or five minutes or whatever, is a good way to to really start to get um, unpredictable errors in your system. And so Sidekick does not allow job timeouts for that reason, and Factory doesn't either. The, um, what I tell people is that your background job itself should pull if it needs to know whether it should stop. Um, and then there are times where a worker process will just simply lock up, maybe deadlock, and that's a case where the worker library e either needs to emit backtraces so that you can sort of track down where the deadlock happened or you need to get real good with GDB. So it gets uh, it can get pretty tough to, to debug that kind of stuff. Any other questions so far? All right, so the third tip is concurrency, everybody's favorite topic. Um, Sidekick is multi-threaded. Factory Worker Ruby is multi-threaded. They're gonna be work, they're gonna be executing many jobs at the same time. And so you need to think about that. I may have a job that's running uh, fine in isolation, but when you execute 10 other jobs side by side with it, is your system gonna fall over? Are you gonna hit API rate limits? Are you gonna run out of database connections or cause your database to fall over because you're suddenly executing 1,000 jobs in parallel? That is, uh, the, the, you'll, you'll quickly hit scalability issues if you don't think about those things and, and how to manage that. So uh, there's no easy answer there, but it, it's something to be aware of. Uh, and like I said, uh, I do have the commercial stuff which uh, supports me in my business. Uh, Factory Pro has additional features. Uh, Factory Enterprise, will, I'm, I'm planning on doing that second half of, of 2019. But it'll, it'll, the two features that it'll likely lead with are throttling and um, batches. So if you create 100 jobs, you can say, fire a callback when all 100 of these jobs are done, which uh, can be very useful when you're fanning out a lot of work to dozens of machines. You have no idea when all that work is done. And so that's, that's what bat batches are designed to solve. And then, of course, queue throttling kind of goes back to that concurrency thing. Uh, throttling is a, a frequent request from customers, and Sidekick, unfortunately, cannot implement it, but I think Factory can because of its different architecture. So uh, that's a little bit about that side. Uh, that's all I have. Any other questions? Well, the idea with queue throttling is, let's say you're hitting eBay, and eBay has a limit of 10 API calls 
um, per second. No, that's not a good example. Uh, let's say you're doing video encoding and you know your, your system will fall over if you do more than 20 video encodes at the same time. Uh, what you would do is you'd throw those encoding jobs into a, into a custom queue. Let's say, call it encoding, the encoding queue. Uh, and then you would tell factory only allow 20 of these jobs to be happening in parallel. So, um, that, yeah, rate limits are different from throttling. They kind of seem like they're the same, but they're, they're actually a little bit different. Throttling is when you slow yourself down, and rate limits are when the other system slows you down. Yeah, exactly. There, there's, um, there's different ways of doing that. Throttling is one way. Um, Sidekick Enterprise has a rate limiting API, so it will actually track your rate limits and make sure that your jobs are not hitting that third-party API more than the SLA, um, but it does not implement throttling. The way it works is it'll pull jobs as fast as possible, and then it'll just raise errors if they're going over the rate limit and, and just pu push off those jobs until later. So it's it's a little bit it's a little bit dumb in that regard, but it, it works for a lot of cases. Yeah, well, because Sidekick is talking directly to Redis, and Redis doesn't know. Redis is just a dumb thing. You just say, "Give me a job," right? Um, with Factory, since it's a single point that everybody's talking to, you can kind of dole out or drip out the jobs. A worker says, give me a job from this queue, you can say, well, I've, factory can track the fact that you've already got three jobs of this type, and it'll just skip that queue, right? It's already got three jobs from that particular queue that are in flight. And then once the worker acts that job, then now you're down to two, and you can hand out the next one to the next worker that wants it. I mean, throttling, uh, throttling is more precise because you, you literally will only get like three at a time, right? It, 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 will, it will break it down into blocks like that. The, the issue though is that if, if your rate limit is, if you're throttling because of a rate limit from eBay or something, eBay's rate limit might be 10 per second, but that's not the way throttling works. Throttling is you can only have 10 in flight at a given point in time, right? So it's different semantics. Yeah, so, it, so it, it, it can be tough. Uh, it might be a case where um, you know I can provide both, and you can mix and match as necessary. But um, but that stuff that stuff is hard to implement. And anybody who's implemented rate limiting before knows knows that 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 stuff can be tricky to get right. Sure. What else? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> when you tell a factory to shut down, first thing it does is stop accepting new commands. So you can't push any new work to it, you can't fetch any new work. Um, and, then, and then it tells Redis um, uh, it's, it needs to shut down ASAP. And so factory will wait for Redis to shut down and then factory itself will shut down. So, um, uh, and then likewise at startup, Factory will, first thing it does is it, it will boot up Redis and then it'll start accepting new connections from workers and clients. So it's, uh, it's, an, embedded, it's an embedded copy of Redis. Uh, you just need to have Redis installed on the machine, but it manages where Redis is persisting the data and it manages the life cycle of Redis. So you don't need to know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the worker package is just a library that's specific to whatever language you're using. Hopefully it's idiomatic. So your JavaScript uh, API will be uh, an idiomatic 
um, pleasure to use within that, that language. But as for sort of the runtime deployment container that you're using, that's up to your application to decide. I have customers that are running factory within Docker. I have customers that are using factory just running directly on a Linux box that they manage or on an EC2 instance. Um, that's, that's up to you and however you want to deploy your system. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You um, you can create as many clients and as many workers as you want. They'll um, uh, they'll it'll scale, you know, to to sort of whatever scale you need within reason. Um, factory will st start to fall over after about two to three thousand jobs per second. So if you need to do more than that, I would argue you're getting out of the realm of business transactions and you're getting more into like data processing of like sort of more bulk data. Um, like for instance, people have asked me, um, I wanna process my logs and I wanna create a background job for every line in my log files. Uh, well, n probably that's not gonna be a great idea. Uh, you can create a job for every log file um, or maybe like every thousand lines in your log. Maybe, maybe that would be a good background job. I'm not sure, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's not, you, you, I think it's more of background jobs as sort of coarse-grained business operations that you want to perform and not necessarily for each individual data element that I want to process, I'm going to create a job. Uh, you cannot do that. And that's because, again, it manages Redis itself. So there's no other databases that are competing for space. It's always gonna use database zero, right? Because it has its own file uh, on the file system. Um, I can actually show you that if you care to see it, but. Um, so. This is a Redis CLI that's going directly into factory. Um, uh, what did I do here? Scan. Zero. Four. So yeah, so you can see there's just a bunch of keys. This is the data that, that um, part of the data that factory is using. Uh, oh, I wanted to do keys. That's what I wanted to do. Keys star. So there's all the, um, Here's all the data. Here's the here's the retry queue. Um, what else do we have here? I don't see any queues. Right? Oh, there's, there's queues in there somewhere, but hard to read. Um, but yeah, it's just a normal Redis. Uh, you can attach to it uh, through the socket that it exposes. And um, where were we? We were in uh, factory DB. So the Redis data file is just factory.rdb. That's the, so it's just, it's just an RDB like you would get with Redis. You can, if you wanna back that up, CP, that's all you do. Um, and that gives you an immediate backup of your, your Redis data. Uh, and you can see I was doing some testing with large volumes of data there. <laughs> Huge.rdb. It's Redis. Redis is single threaded. Yeah. Which is nice, um, but it ultimately puts a, a scalability limit when you're trying to do sort of more complex data operations. Um, you're running, you know, more complex multi transactions. Um, it's just going to, you're going to hit a, uh, you're going to hit a limit within Redis. Now, what I tell people is, is, uh, you know, you can run multiple factories. You don't have to, you, know, you don't have to create everything in one factory. Um, you can have, if your app wants to break into microservices or have different services for different portions of your app, you can have different factories for that. And that's kind of the way you scale generally. Yeah, exactly. What 
I don't know what. I mean, I I'm not a Rabbit user, so I'm I'm not sure kind of what scalability it has. I'm sure it could do hundreds of thousands of messages per second. The, yeah, I mean, the thing to remember though is that um, uh, sending a message is not necessarily a background job, and so I don't, I don't know what it's going to do in with regards to scheduling. Like, I don't think in Rabbit you can schedule a message to appear a day from now, right? So the, the, that's exactly the, this kind of job scheduling that you can do. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, your factory is not um, uh, a silver bullet. Rabbit's not a silver bullet. Kafka is not a silver bullet. You you sort of make trade-offs and you decide what is important for your app and, and sort of the semantics you need. And I I'm a big fan of background jobs. Uh, I worked at an e-commerce system and we did everything through Sidekick, and it was amazing. It worked really really well. And we had you know we had hundreds of jobs per second going through the system, and it was just a nice steady flow of asynchronous goodness. Well, you saw the JavaScript involved with 20 lines of code. I mean, that's as pretty micro service as you get, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, you can you can break your app into as mi as many smaller app chunks as you want, right? Apps are fractal. <laughs> you can you can break an app into many many smaller apps, and each one of those could have its own copy of factory running, its own team managing that smaller app. What would that be uh, I mean, I, I think I think. Uh, an application should generally reflect your organizational structure. So if you just have a single engineering team, you should just have a single monorail or monolith. Um, and then as you split out teams, each team is gonna take its own sort of service and that, those services are just apps. They're just, they're, I guess you might think of them as smaller apps because they're, they're focused more on a niche. But, um, but each of those apps could have their own queues and jobs that they need to perform. Anything else? All right. Thank you.